Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the rationalinvestor.com's uh, weekend frivolity. It's broiler chickens time. Buck, 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 buck. Um, hello, everyone. Um, and a, a big hello and congratulations to uh, the level oneers who uh, you um, really. Hello, hey, everyone. look at that. We're live on YouTube. Um, yeah. Um, and um, um, <laughs> I made my cat. <laughs> That's funny. So congratulations to the level oneers. You made it to the end of level one program. So proud of you guys. And actually, you're very, very active right here heading into the final exam. Uh, you gave Grim one hell of a workout this morning. Uh, and I hope, you know, the limited information that I was able uh, to post in the uh, in the room as Grim was chit-chatting away and answering your questions. Um uh, I hope my, um, you know, I added a few extra images and stuff like that to just sort of help, you know, see, Im you know, ideas a little clearer. I hope that helped. But um, I, we did have quite a few questions. Um, you know, my goodness, uh, you guys really stepped up and uh, and showed how much you were paying attention through this. So I'm so proud of you. And, you know, again... Big uh, a round of applause uh, for the Wookiee, um, and I absolutely love this. Like, if I can actually get you to the point where you can actually teach this stuff to the next person, then I've done my job. And uh, the Wookiee um, is absolutely perfect example of uh, each and every one of you um, can easily be in exactly the same place he is. Um, and all it takes is just work. That's it. Right. The information is there. Do you want to run with the ball? And ideally, man, I'd love to have all of you guys um, continue on with me and uh, and ultimately join the TRI team to spread the spread the gospel. Of um, one guy I used to work with, he used to call, say that I uh, sped uh, financial literacy. <laughs> and actually, we were even joking about that in the classroom, right? That. Uh, we have to understand, especially those people that are interested in cryptocurrencies, this is extremely speculative stuff. And what you just saw over the past year or two is the definition of venture capital and extreme speculation. Um, and if we can learn the tools uh, that we teach, especially things like trade location tools, at the very least, what we're simply doing is just trying to tilt the odds a little bit in your favor. You can imagine all the people that came in and bought crypto at the top of 2017. They're probably getting absolutely destroyed now, and they've probably given up hope. And ironically enough, we're actually in, in the environment, I think, where now actually is when the serious investors are stepping up. So go figure. Um, excellent, Troy. Well, uh Dude, we're going to rock your world. Somebody pop onto the YouTube page. Uh, Colleen, can you just pop onto the uh, YouTube page and tell Troy a little bit about how we've uh, slightly affected how you look at the universe? <laughs> I don't know whether uh, you can uh, help somebody, but Troy's uh, all there by himself over on YouTube. Uh, any of you level oneers, if you could pop over to that YouTube page and just reassure him that... Uh, that he will definitely look at the world uh, from a very different perspective once we're done with him. So anyway, the point of the matter here is, uh, as I've said repeatedly, the purpose of this uh, show um, on Sundays here following the level one class, the primary purpose is to uh, answer any unaddressed questions that the level oneers had um, that maybe I could help uh, expound on, and then also too to run through the Twitter uh, feed and just sort of you know explain sort of my thinking and what I'm doing in the market. Um, and I suppose a lot of people are uh, you know I did see there quite a bit of uh, feedback, quite a bit of interest in me finally booking my loss on Newbit. <laughs> uh, that nightmare is finally over. But anyway, I gave him a chance, you know. Uh, and then of course, uh, uh, Bitterix. Uh, and actually, you know, this is a really good lesson for all the uh, current level oneers about having coins listed on multiple exchanges. Uh, there was somebody in the lounge this morning. Um, we were throwing around an idea, and I think there was just a really sweet uh, little uh, gift that was given to a whole bunch of our, um, you know, veterans and guys who were, you know, quick on the trigger uh, this morning. And uh, what the hell was that coin? 
It was, uh, I want to say GTO or something along those lines. GT, GTO, yeah. Oh, own. Oh, were you were you paying attention through that? Um, and when I pulled up the exchange listings of that GTO, I saw that it's like all over the map. I mean, it's everywhere. It's listed everywhere. And like the thickest market is like the OK Coin uh, platform, which is really different. And um, you know, for all the Da Vinci fans. Um, on the site, uh, he actually uh, one of his fundamental screener that he built years ago with us. Um, he would actually give a scoring system on how many uh, exchanges was your coin actually listed on. So the fact that Newbit was only on Bitterix uh, into the dire end, and I think it was on some other sort of you know minor exchange that really had no volume at all, was probably. And then when Bitterix said announced that they were going to delist it, that was sort of the final death blow for me. So I had to just simply buck up and blow the position out. Um, so we can talk a little bit about that later on. And I know uh, a lot of people are probably, uh, you know, that's the, the one thing that they want to hear me talk about. But please understand the primary purpose of this is to really help the level oneers um, just kick ass with the material that they're uh, working with. So to that end, uh, coming out of the class, um, I, you know, there were a few and there were some really interesting questions that I don't think were actually directly related to uh, the level one program, but you know, I mean, uh, we're here to help. We're here to try and answer as many questions as possible. So uh, I actually asked them just to go into um, our uh, daily brief request room and uh, and post those. So you know, like Colleen and uh, Own and um, you know Alicia and I think uh, B Bloom. I think you're also in the level one, aren't you? Um, I see you guys here in the lounge uh, with me here. Any of you others that are happen to be in the level one? Yeah, there you are, dude. Uh, and you got questions, you know, make sure to put them down here so that I can uh, speak to them here. Um, all right, so where should we begin first? Um, you know, just the questions that were posted today. Uh, Tom asked, Brian, you mentioned in Grimm's tutorial, re-log scale, use log to measure growth, use linear if value of asset is same, given price like a futures contract where your profit is X dollars per point. Could you go over this with an example, please? Sure. Um, you know, you have to understand that if you're going to trade a futures contract and really to a certain degree, I think that uh, that the Bitcoin forwards contracts and stuff that are listed are the same, but you know they might be different. I can't remember just off the top of my head, but you know, especially with futures contracts, if you are trading uh, crude oil, for example, um, and the price is fifty dollars a barrel, and the exchange sets uh, the uh, futures contract at like one thousand barrels. Uh, and you have to put like X amount of uh, principal up, usually like 5% or something. So uh, at $50 a barrel, 1,000 barrels, that's 50 grand. Um, and 5% of that's like $2,500. <laughs> I think actually it's quite a bit higher. But anyway, when I was uh, prop trading crude years ago, uh, crude was around $100 a barrel. But because it's a thousand barrels, the money multiplier, the multiplier that you see on the contract at fifty dollars, uh, if it goes to fifty dollars and one cent, and you bought at fifty dollars and you sold at fifty dollars and one cent, excluding commissions, um, that would basically be a ten dollar movement in your account value. So um, if the price was seventy five dollars, uh, seventy five dollars to seventy dollar five dollars and one cent that one penny movement is because it's a thousand contracts it's or a thousand barrels it's ten dollars doesn't change it's no difference um, if that crude contract is a hundred dollars and it goes from a hundred dollars to a hundred dollars and one cent that's ten dollars uh, on your contract no difference so it do, doesn't really matter whether uh, you're doing, uh, you know, the crude contract, 50 bucks, 75 bucks, 100 bucks, doesn't make a difference. So in those kind of cases, especially um, a lot of like floor traders, they just use, simply use uh, linear charts because it just doesn't make a difference. Um, in the stock market, though, however, we have to understand that Stocks, by definition, are uh, earnings engines. So you have to uh, put into perspective um, 
relative earnings performance. Uh, and so what I meant here was that, you know, if you were going to measure a, an asset that's like, um, you know, and, you know, probably a really good example is something like Amazon or something where they just keep growing and growing and growing their earnings, just keep growing and growing and growing. Um, you have to understand that a penny in earnings um, is represents a huge difference. Right? Maybe we'll look at Facebook here. Um, so if you want to measure the actual impact of a change in earnings, you know, I, I much prefer to use like stocks that are like a dollar or something, because then you can really see the difference. Um, and let's say, you know, let's say here, for example, they earned a dollar a share, um, and then they jumped that to like $2 a share, or basically uh, doubled their earnings. Um, if we're way up here, and maybe their earnings are like $10 a share, and they increase them by a dollar a share, earnings are not doubling. In fact, earnings are only going up 10%. So as a result, to measure this as a growth asset um, and to put the actual number change into perspective, like relatively speaking, um, we have to use a logarithmic scale. Now, I'm not quite sure. I, you know, like I see a lot of people, especially um, with regard to Bitcoin, use log scale to measure uh, the growth of Bitcoin. Um, you know, because Bitcoin doesn't have earnings, and technically its supply is, uh, is, is relatively fixed, um, I don't know how you interpret um, uh, price, you know, growth versus log. And what, I, what I've personally found, um, I suppose growth versus log in, in a Bitcoin scenario and a commodity scenario would be sort of um, the, uh, maybe like the inflation rate, uh, but that's getting a little bit sort of, you know, just talking out my butt here. Um, and if I was trading like a futures contract on, say, Facebook, if there was something that existed like that, or like, say, the S&P 500, S&P 500 is probably a good example because um, we can look at it both from both perspectives. So if I looked at the S&P 500, um, you know, I'd just do like a nice simple uh, chart. Because technically it is both a uh, earnings engine um, and, you know, growth proxy um, and a commodity that's tradable, I think you can look at it from both perspectives. So the regular sort of trading um, range, um, would, you would use this linear chart if you were trading a futures contract. And basically one point, and I think uh, now it's like one point is $2.50, on the S&P futures contract, everything would be the same. So you'd use uh, a linear scale. If however, you are an investor in the stock market um, and you are measuring the value of the S&P 500 relative to its earnings growth, um, then we'd use things like log scale, which is um, going to skew the, uh, the chart uh, very differently. Um, that's about the best way that I can describe the difference between log and linear is uh, traders primarily use linear because every one point difference to them makes no difference. Um, investors in things like growth engines and, it, you know, I, I'd be really interested to hear sort of how the, the uh, logarithmic um, growth story of Bitcoin, maybe it's adoption. Um, if you wanted to see the long-term growth of an asset, um, and it, you know, specifically with regard to, uh, to, um, uh, equities and stocks, it's all about the earnings change and what 
what impact does a one penny change in the earnings picture look like? And as I said, you know, really cheap stocks, you know, like uh, maybe had earnings of like a penny a share, a one penny a share change in earnings. Well, that's that's like doubling earnings. That's going to have a material impact uh, down below. Uh, but if you if you're earning like a ten dollars a share and you have a one penny change in earnings, well, that's only going to be like one percent. So that's why I think that log scales uh, are more appropriate for stocks. So that would be my uh, simple answer to that. But I do know that there are a lot of people that follow um, things like Bitcoin on a log scale. Um, and when when I look at Bitcoin on a log scale, I do see some very interesting information. Um, let's go uh, log. Uh, and I do know, like, uh, there are quite a few people that do uh, use uh, the log scale to try and uh, describe uh, the growth of Bitcoin over the longer term. Um, is this a function of of mass adoption? um and acceptance in the marketplace um the issue that i have with this is that technically one bitcoin here is basically the same as one bitcoin here the only difference is maybe we could make an argument that the happening events um because of that reduced payout to the miners that has a logarithmic effect so uh, a halvening of the payout here is very different than a halvening of the payout up here. So that's probably why uh, logarithmic is is appropriate for Bitcoin. Um, it's a very good question. You know, very good. Um, I don't know how we can use uh, log scales um, to uh, value things like altcoins because they are so extremely volatile. Um, you know, like this one, this EOS, for example. And we have an old rule in the marketplace that this is like what they call too far too fast. And quite often we have to correct a huge chunk of that. But what does that look like if we change it to a logarithmic scale? Uh, I don't know whether that helps us explain the situation anymore. I, I just don't know. That's, um, that's a tough one. And for me, as a as a trader, quote unquote, really more when it comes to altcoins as an investor, um, I just simply really like to hunt against the bottom end of linear ranges. But one thing I really do love to do, which helps me a lot, is I like to draw trend lines off of previous peaks to give me sort of an indication of where next resistance come in. And I think the linear chart, I think, does that better for me. So, you know, it'd be interesting to see if these levels change materially. They probably don't. They should be the same price point. Um, but actually, you know, that, and it's a very good question, right? Uh, I get this question asked a lot. Um, and the simple answer that I would give is think about, you know, especially when it comes to equity investing, think about things like earnings and what is a dollar change in the price of a stock Um and 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 they'd say a penny change in earnings, uh, relatively speaking, you know, given where um, the stock uh, currently is, uh, and where its where its earnings are currently, and and what does a one point change in those earnings mean, um, percentage wise? Um, okay, so that was one question. Um, I'll see if I can get through this stuff, but uh, I hope that helps answer that question. If anything, um, that's an excellent sort of student of the market question. Where was that page? Was it over here? Uh, nope. Uh, I don't, oh, you know what? I think it was that Twitter page. Yeah, here we go. Uh, all right. Um, okay, so that was right here. So, Tom, I don't know whether that helps answer that. Uh, I, and really, I think you just wanted me to expound upon that a little bit. I hope that helped a bit. Especially when it comes to things like commodities trading, I think that's absolutely critical, right? I wouldn't, if I was day trading crude, I wouldn't look at it on a log scale. Okay, Own Pollution says, I'm a little confused about liquidity events, upcoming BTC ETF in particular. Well, who isn't? 
And here's the problem with this BTC ETF event is, uh, you know, how long has this soap opera been going on? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, the sad part about it is, is that uh, at some point the market, yeah, it's like Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad analogy, eh? And then they're just gonna hold the call the whole fucking thing off. <laughs> anyway, so you know, I definitely think like, man, did you see uh, own? Did you see the price action of Bitcoin around that very first ETF event? And I think what's probably gonna happen here is that they're just gonna called chicken so many times that after a while the market's just going to sort of lose interest i can already see it you know a lot of sort of crypto twitter people and that kind of stuff they're like uh would you just fucking go away we've had enough of this nonsense <laughs> just go away <laughs> you know <laughs> um but th this was the first one Right. I don't know whether you even and the irony of it all is there's a lot of people in crypto right now that weren't even around but this was the very first one. And actually, it was interesting. Somebody in the lounge this morning, um, maybe I'll put that on a daily chart so you can actually see how violent that was. Uh, but somebody in the lounge this morning even posted a, um, a uh, video by Arthur Hayes, uh, which I thought was really great. In fact, I think I even retweeted it because I was so impressed with that. Uh, where was that Twitter page? Is this it? Yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, just even this morning, uh, right here. Uh, I think I think it's really everybody should listen to this guy. I thought it was a really really good interview. Um, I don't know who this gentleman is, but uh, excellent interviewer, far uh, more stable and more calm and more uh, ed reasoned and and educated interviewer than I am. I'm so up and down like a horse drawers. But a uh, great interview of uh, Arthur here. And I thought Arthur was extremely candid. I actually really, I was really impressed with how candid he was. But he even talked about how on Max, on that event, all hell broke loose. Uh, it was classic by the rumor sell the news. That was this. Own, were you in crypto through this? I mean, look at this. He was saying that, uh, you know, in like like literally less than a day, the price of Bitcoin swung more than 30%. Do you remember that? So this was a classic by the rumor. And then, and literally this candle was right up top here. And then the news came out and the market just collapsed. Hey, <laughs> you knew, but you didn't know what was going on. So it was an absolutely textbook uh, by the rumor, sell the news. Uh, and, you know, the interesting thing is, is back uh, last cycle, we had lots of these events. Um, the actual mark that I think actually marked the turn in Bitcoin, I think, was this event. And this quite literally was a ramp up into the second uh, U.S. Marshall Office's auction um, of the... Um, Silk Road uh, seized Bitcoins. Classic buy the rumor on the actual auction event date, sell the news, and the price tanked shortly thereafter. Perfect example of a liquidity event. Does that make sense, Owen? So uh, if anything, go back and do some research on November 3rd, November 4th, November 5th of 2015. November 6th, it was absolutely perfect textbook example of buy the rumor, sell the news. And the irony of it all is that, you know, you guys all just learned this. Watch this, Owen. This will freak you out. Was there anybody in particular that might have been active right on that event? Do, 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 do. Look who stopped the market in its tracks. <laughs> Have we ever seen this guy around? Doink. <laughs> All right, 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 I'm going to eat you up. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> oh, now I'm just being silly. Isn't that cool, though? So you had a liquidity event window, right? And it came right into exactly a level um, 
<laughs> Thanks, Colleen. It came exactly right into a level that we should have expected there was going to be uh, sellers, right? So there you go. And of course, yeah, uh, Oscar. Hey, Oscar, nice seeing you, bud. Uh, say hi to your brother for me. Um, I mean, this the, uh, we talked about this in class, so that's why they weren't referencing it. But holy crap. This is like the absolute textbook definition of buy the rumor. And the worst part about this is, do you think that this was slightly encouraged here by Goldman Sachs? <laughs> Goldman Sachs. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> you guys remember? I don't even know if there's even many people. At Chris, you were around. I don't know if there's any others that are even in the call here that were around that. But we spent this whole summer, especially in through here, Goldman Sachs is all bullish and they're putting out their uh, Elliott Wave analysis. And we had one guy on the site who was like a cousin of that uh, Goldman Sachs analyst. And he was sort of, uh, you know, spoon feeding us her information and stuff. I mean, this was just so cliche. And then also, too, and this is crazy Brian talk, but... Is there something that's supposed to happen every 17 and a half years that often marks catalysts in these kind of markets? So not only was this a beautiful sort of, you know, uh, fundamental event window for the price to rally into, it was also the perfect apex uh, of uh, long-term, you know, greed, fear cycle event windows. And, you know, the irony of it all is that when this was happening, I couldn't sell that story to anybody. Uh, there is one guy uh, on the Internet who's saying, I'm the only guy who said that the market was going to top here. Uh, you know, I don't even give a shit about that kind of stuff. But I can fully say for myself that all of our educational material, uh, we've been talking about this cycle's peak here um, for quite some time. It really doesn't surprise me. In fact, actually, we often show this chart. You guys ever seen me post this chart before? Isn't it ironic how after the fact, and I even remember like even some new level oneers that were coming in, were going, no, no way, man, that's not going to, that's not the way it's going to develop. Well, this was gold and silver through the last fear cycle apex. And this is Bitcoin and Ethereum through this particular cycle's apex. Uh, well, yeah, um, you know, the problem here is, uh, is, uh, so, uh, Twingle, Twingle, am I pronouncing your name right? It says, end fear, start greed. Um, you know, like technically they say, if you actually look at the stock market, that the stock market bull market that took us into the dot-com peak, it didn't actually officially start till like, uh, I think it was like sort of halfway through 1982. And you can see how these assets, uh, gold here and silver here, they actually peaked in 1979. So could there be like a two or three year window for us to have to traverse to get through to the start of that next greed cycle? Sure. I think that's that's totally plausible. Um and, you know, usually at the end of e uh, economic cycles, like 10-year cycles, there's got to be a recession somewhere in here. Um, it's not here today, so thank heavens. You know, maybe we can still push a little bit higher here on crypto. It's kind of funny that uh, Tom uh, Tom Lee, I think that's his, he's now calling, he's saying, okay, well, 10,000 is realistic for Bitcoin in 2019. <laughs> I did it. I, it was interesting. Arthur said that within a few years, he could see 50,000 on Bitcoin. Uh, you know, uh, we'll see how it goes. I actually put a, um, I did an interview for a, um, a uh, website and actually, you know, YouTubers and I'm the, today's the episode's kind of disjointed. So uh, I apologize everybody, but I, like Colleen says, I'm having fun today. So I'm on my top game when I'm having fun. But uh, midweek, I did an interview uh, with um, Bitcoinist. I think, yeah, these guys here. Uh, how to become a better Bitcoin trader. Um, I have these very uh, nice people. Uh, really like working with them. Very agreeable. Um, and um, not a bad idea. There's good old Brian. Ten years ago, though, she's got a fraction of that hair left. 
So not a bad idea. In fact, I'll even uh, post this um, in the uh, YouTube uh, text box there if you guys want to read this. This is what I really think what like a real you know professional trader's life is all about. Um, and my sort of, you know, my conclusion where I was going with all this uh, down, you know, below, of course, they always say, well, you, you know, you, you've got to, uh, we have to ask the question, what's your prediction for Bitcoin? Um, you know, I, if my simple answer to them, and um, uh, this is what I think, is um, if Bitcoin stays a store of value coin, I mean, it's not like people went out and started using gold and like, you know, manufacturing, they do to a certain degree with electronics, but it's not that much. Um, and, you know, the Indians uh, used to have the, um, the annual wedding season. And actually that's where we used to get a lot of annual demand for gold when I was a stockbroker and playing the uh, mining stocks here in Vancouver. Uh, we used to like depend on the Indian wedding season to to boost gold prices, um, but if I you know to all intents and purposes, gold is basically a store of value story. So you know if crypto stays a store of value story, then really my hunch is that your Bitcoin chart is going to look something like this for the next you know this is like 10, 15 years, uh, and your silver chart is going to look something like this. Um, if, however, Bitcoin can make this transition into a utility um, and, you know, things like the Lightning Network uh, really catch on, or, 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 um, then maybe we can have a scenario where Bitcoin can break this store of value model. I still think that to all intents and purposes, especially the amount of speculation that's involved in uh, crypto, because really a lot of people just got involved in crypto because everybody else was, quote unquote, getting rich. And so, you know, we had a lot of people on the site that came on that were just like that. <laughs> so, which is kind of sad, but, you know, long and short of it here is if you really want to learn how to be a trader and understand long-term cycles, that's what Brian's really here to uh, teach you guys. So, the point here is if we can traverse from this store of value story to a growth story, a growth vehicle, uh, mass adoption, that kind of thing, um, everybody in the world has to have a crypto, um, then I think, you know, we could break this model. But for the time being, I'm still very much in this sort of store of value kind of story. Um, and, you know, uh, just as gold here, uh, you know, sold off to a low, here, maybe we'll put on the numbers, um, sold off to a low here of uh, two, three hundred bucks. It did almost double, double. Um, so, you know, Bitcoin comes down to 3000. Can we work our way back up to 6000? You know, if we do a 50% rule, just like I've done here, I don't know whether these are exact numbers, just total, you know, eyeballing this. You can see 50,000. There's uh, Tom Lee's 10,000 number. Could we ultimately, uh, over the next, you know, year or so, especially if uh, politicians uh, start getting themselves into serious legal hot water? Um, and people really lose confidence in sort of fiat currency system. Central banks are just basically printing money, just not even concerned about the value of the currency itself. Could we get in another nice little counter trend rally up into 10,000 area here? I think that's totally realistic. I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, so uh, kind of totally off topic there, but uh, hopefully I help. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> I can't remember. Oh, terrible. And somebody's like, you talk too much, Brian. I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> On YouTube. I'm sorry. I do. Um, okay. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. We were talking about buy the rumor, sell the news. I totally forgot about that. So, Own, did a couple of those illustrations of buy the rumor, sell the news, did that help? Where are you, Own? Are you still here? Own, come in, Own. Uh, oh, I was talking to, um, primarily how come it didn't have effect on gold in 2003? Um, well, um, you know, the interesting thing about the world back in 2003 was, and it's actually ironic because it's probably going to be very similar. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I mean, you tell me, it almost looks to me like uh, that might have been your event horizon. 
right there, right? What was the date back in 2003? Because right there, there's February 2003. I'd be willing to bet that that probably was your event right there. So that would be like a buy the rumor, sell the news. And interestingly enough, you should look at this gold chart and you should say, holy moly, that's one big ass W, my friend. Actually, and you know what? This looks really similar to what we saw on Bitcoin with that U.S. Uh, Marshall Office's auction, right? Remember I showed you that, that 2015 bottom? Look at this gold chart, right? You see the way that a bottom came up, broke out, and slammed back down into that level, right? And then we'll go in uh, March 2003. So there's February, March. So that would have been right there. So it's probably a bit of a, like an anticipatory by the rumor. March 28th, yeah. But I guess, you know, what I would actually say is it almost looks to me like, remember, long-term cycles, right? This was the dot-com boom. You couldn't, and you literally own, I don't know whether you remember this or not, but you couldn't give away gold here. Do you remember that? I mean, you literally could not give it away. I was a broker. I remember I had one stock, uh, BGO. Um, it was a uh, beam of gold and it's book value was like a dollar 50 a share. And it was trading at like 30 cents a share. I mean, just ridiculous. You couldn't give them away and own. Do you remember why? No. Well, actually there was a really, really bad scandal in the gold market. And kind of like, you know, I suppose with, you know, like our hacks and all that big connect and all that kind of stuff didn't get nearly as bad. But right here in 1999, 1998, right here, there was just a horrible scandal in the gold market, Briex. So maybe do some research about Briex. But the point here is that we were at a very, you know, like everybody was buying growth. Everybody was buying growth. And I, I think you can actually make the argument that your ETF event was actually the catalyst that actually people looked at the charts and went, holy Jesus, that's one of Beamish's W's. I better get in there and buy that. All right? Can you see the W? I mean, if you're an investor, this is like a wet dream. This is exactly what you want to see to consider investing in assets. It's, it's textbook like all you YouTubers. I mean, this is what you want to see. It's just as simple as that. All right? And like I said, on Bitcoin, yeah, and actually, I think I've been talking about this for a while. Uh, where's, I guess we have it over here somewhere. Uh, where was that chart I was just showing you guys on Bitcoin? Uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. And somebody actually, I think it was you, Owen, said that there's an extension I can go and buy or whatever that, Let's me label these tabs, <laughs> which shouldn't be such a bad idea. Eh? But look at 2015. Can you see the similarities? You see the big breakout on uh, Bitcoin here? Down, up, down, up, down, breakout. And then boom, slam right into that level. That is literally exactly the same chart. You see that? And there, we'll even change it to a line chart for you. Line, all right. There's the W, breakout, slam back into that level. They call this a Wyckovian check. You might want to write that down, Wyckoff. Uh, slam into that level. And gee whiz, you want to see something funny? Uh, watch what happens. <laughs> this is almost comical. Watch what happens when we draw. And actually, I don't know whether it was this exchange or whether it was uh, Phoenix, but it's almost funny. I think I've done this for you guys before. But uh, look who stopped that move. <laughs> you see? Oh, this son of a bitch. He always makes money. <laughs> always. Rah, rah, rah. Here I am. Woohoo. I'm going to do a cartwheel for Colleen. Look at me. Woo look at me, Colleen. Look at me. Look at me. Look what I can do. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? I mean, what do you think, guys? Can you see why it's so important that I uh, want you guys to be able to acknowledge 
I mean, geez, you YouTubers, man. I mean, that's gold right there. That is like literally everything that we teach in trade location. I'll even give that to you guys here. Um, well, <coughs> so hopefully you can see the, the difference, right? Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know whether this was a 61.8, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was. Uh, I suppose we could go probably, I don't know, off of that level. So there's reload zone right there. I absolutely love when reload zones line up with horizontal support and resistance. Oh, my goodness. Wet dream central. So uh, didn't quite get down to uh, Mountain Man of the entire range there. But, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, and I don't know whether, you know, you're actually maybe placing too much uh, weight on that ETF gold issuance. Because, like I said, this is a very, very different world that we lived in. A lot of people were really concerned here about things like, you know, Osama bin Laden and terrorism and all that. You guys even remember that? I remember uh, sitting on our balcony, my wife and I, we used to overlook uh, Vancouver Harbor. And the, literally for a month or two, all we talked about was scuba divers coming and sinking all the cruise ships in Vancouver Harbor, which, of course, was completely unrealistic. I, can you imagine <laughs> terrorists from Afghanistan in scuba gear? <laughs> but that was, that was all the worry here in Vancouver. It was almost crazy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There's not not a lot of uh, fresh drinking water over there. I don't know about swimming pools. <laughs> anyway, that's me being a little bit silly. Sorry, everyone. So um, anyway, uh, I hope that helps answer your question there, Owen. I think maybe you're putting a little too weight on too much weight on that uh, gold ETF event, but that's just my two cents. All uh, right, uh, next one. Can you please explain the numbers that show up if we point out one specific volume bar considering that we are trading BTC? All right, now what the hell are you looking at here? Uh, looks like you got your mouse over this bar. And um, I think by default, trading view, whoops, I almost knocked my microphone off the table. Uh, by default, TradingView actually has like a moving average on their volume studies, if I'm not mistaken. So I think what you're looking at is you're looking at the raw volume bar. And that's like if this is Bitcoin, that is the number of Bitcoins that traded. Um, and then you're looking at probably a moving average of uh, that volume bar. So if I pull up, uh, where's that chart that I was just showing you guys? Was it off of here? Uh, I think it was over here, wasn't it? Here we go again. I need owns uh, tab identification tool. God, I can't remember which one it was. Uh, um, it was this direction. Yeah, here we go. So uh, if we go into the indicator, actually, no. We, you know, why don't we look at one of our, hey, why don't we look at our crappy little new bits trade? So FYI, everybody, and you all saw the uh, tweet, so I guess I don't really need to talk about it too much. I uh, took a major punch in the nose on this one. I uh, was buying this new bid story when they were technically a stable coin. Then they uh, lost their stability, and the price collapsed. Um, I was in it and you know, on the collapse. Uh, it was a little bit too late for me to do anything. This was technically one of our stable coins. It was like a place to park money uh, when we didn't know where Bitcoin was going. And the irony of it all is actually most of this thing that I bought was actually even where Bitcoin was like half of the price that it is today. I did buy another uh, you know, Bitcoin worth down here when Bitcoin was right up top. Um, and I finally threw in the towel here. Just said, you know what, enough's enough with the... Um, with the uh, Trex delisting notice, uh, the last thing I wanted to do is just take a 100% loss on this thing. Um, could I have blown it out anywhere along here? Uh, and keep in mind, for our accounting purposes and stuff, all this re really was was just a change from a paper loss, which already was recorded in our statements, to a crystallized loss. Now we actually have a capital loss we can declare to the government. Mm, wonderful. Um, and basically, I had just sort of given them the benefit of the doubt and just said, well, let's see what they can do. If they can bring the story back, well, then everything will be fine. But long and short of it here on that Trex uh, delisting notification, I just said, look, at, 
there's no sense in writing this right to zero. Um, I'm, uh, let's just liquidate it. So I made the executive decision and I just blew the position out. I think, you know, one of the main reasons why I actually put this tweet out to the public is I just want you to know, I know a lot of people in the crypto verse and all of that, man, they, they sort of build themselves as bulletproof and they never make mistakes and they're just super brilliant and they're just the best people in the world. And, you know, one thing I'll absolutely tell you YouTubers and I tell all my site people is, hey, I'm just another guy in the market. Um, I'm human, which means I make a lot of mistakes. And trust me, I make my fair share of mistakes. Um, I've been at this game forever. So I've picked up some pointers and I've picked up ways to try and help you stay on the positive side. Keep in mind, most people, like 90 plus percent people that participate in the market lose money. That's why things like index funds and stuff like that are as popular as they are because most people cannot manage their emotions and cannot buy against lows and sell against highs. They do the exact opposite. But, you know, like I said, the main reason why I wanted to post this and send it out to the public is just so that you know, I'm just another schmo in the marketplace just like you. And I take punches in the nose just like everybody else. In fact, my education program, I specifically tell people that you will be wrong. You better get used to it. Ideas will fail. It's just part of the capitalist process. So I just wanted everybody to know that I don't have too big of an ego to admit that, hey, I can lose money just as well as anybody else. <laughs> the ideal, of course, here is you want to spread the jelly. <laughs> Try not to take too much risk in any one particular idea. This was theoretically a stable coin. So that's why I put as much of it into it as I did. I think about two and a half, two and three quarters Bitcoin. Um, because it was supposed to be one of these places that you could put money. And of course, this is one of the main reasons why I've lost complete faith in these quote unquote stable coins. Because they're not really stable. It's just, you know, they tell you it's stable. And if you believe them, great. If you don't, perfectly fine. And in this particular case, the market took a run at them. The market believed that they were not stable and the market broke them. And it sucks. I mean, but keep in mind, I mean, hell, I had I had many, many, many multiples of this in that tether. And as soon as I started to hear uh, this sort of talk about tether troubles, I was just like, oh, let's get the fuck out of this stuff. I've had another, I got, we got, position in and actually there was another stable coin uh bro stake or or uh, bro coin or whatever the hell it was break i think they changed the name to breakout stake or something like that um and uh and it was just uh recently announced that it was going to be delisted from trex now you know uh just to the youtube audience um you know i actually track <laughs> How I'm doing, and, and sadly, it seems that Bitterix, you know, I think I was saying earlier, this is a really good lesson in going through your names and making damn sure you don't buy any coins that are just listed on Trex, because Trex, and this is also a major, major concern about this whole idea of, uh, of decentralized exchanges, because Trex, as a centralized exchange, carries way too much importance and way too much weight in the in the market price discovery process um and you know new bits was only you know it's list i think you know there's like one other exchange which has like almost no volume at all um and so you know is a really good example of um of just horrendous uh systemic risk um that you're taking um oh, is that where, oh okay it's over here uh nbt this is almost oh look at that actually yeah when you do that it doesn't come up eh? i think you gotta go new bits or something like that yeah there it is um when you look at these you know this this has got to be a major warning sign i don't know what south exchange is but clearly they're going to be getting a lot of their business um i don't have an account here and um considering the amount of volume here i was just like you know what screw it i'm just gonna blow it out um 
So, and as I had said earlier, you know, like to all the DAV fans, and I think this was a great, um, um, a great uh, testament to uh, to um, our students actually become um, the most valuable resource of TRI. If I've actually done my job correctly, we should create like an absolute army of well-educated, well-informed traders. And our students, you know, like for example, our level one instructor right now, Grim, started out as a student. And he just worked his way through the whole course material. And, and now he's, um, I would have no problem whatsoever asking him to manage some money of my own. Um, and I thought he did just an exceptional job with the current level oneers. Um, and he's a student of TRI. And Da Vinci, another good example of a student of TRI, working together, we actually created uh, a fundamental screener um, that um, that we even have in our library now because it was it's just such a great tool. Um, I think this is Dabs right here, right? This is Dabs model. Uh, and he even like has in here uh, listed on one exchange minus one. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you can have uh, it listed on multiple exchanges, like I, sh I wanted to show you earlier, um, that uh, there was one name that we were kicking around the site this morning. What was it again? Was it G yeah, GTO? When I saw this, I was like, ooh, wow. Now this is a robust crypto. Watch this. Look at all these markets this thing's traded on. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. You know, that's enough to make you wet your pants. So you, hopefully you can see the difference um, in the quality of, um, of, uh, of coins, right? Uh, oh, and Jonas says NBC doesn't show to be removed either. Yeah, uh, I got to tell you, man, uh, and I'm a little worried about Trex right now because uh, they, of course, just got rejected from their uh, bit licensing thing. Uh, and some people were saying, like, who's putting out these notices about these delistings? Uh, it doesn't seem to be the same person. I don't know. So I don't see usually Trex puts a notice right up at the top here. This coin will be removed on this date. So they may have just totally fucked me. It's totally possible. And if anything, this is a really good, hopefully, um, the, uh, you know, I, I this is the one sort of beef that I've had with Trex is uh, sometimes I, you know, like uh, they had a bunch of uh, recent delistings. And like I said, I like to sort of keep track of how we're doing. Some of these... Um, you know, like I actually had a stink bid working on this gambit. <laughs> and as soon as they announce, and you know, this is the same sort of thing. This is the kind of thing that that concerns me. And Trex should uh, be held accountable at some point down the road. And I have a feeling it's one of the reasons why their New York bid license was rejected was, you know, they obviously knew that they were going to delist this coin. The question is, how far back in time did they go through the review process and decide that this thing was going to be delisted? And why would they let this happen if they knew? Because keep in mind, this is like less than a month. Are you trying to tell me that their delisting decision is done in under a month? Why would they let this happen and this happen? And heaven forbid for Trex especially – if it's ever found out that anybody on inside of Trex either traded anything through this or knew about the delisting while this was going on, they can be held legally liable. So there's a lot of funny business that's going on with Trex that I don't like. It's very concerning. Um, so, you know, I don't know what the heck these new bits uh, situation is here, but I guess I, I've come to learn... And it's been a hard lesson to learn. But especially with coins that are only listed on Trex and stuff. And I think that Gambit, I think that's a case of that. Um, 
And like I said, this is probably a really, really good lesson that um, you just should not uh, buy assets that are listed on just a few exchanges or even one or two. Yeah, like look at this. This this leaves you as an investor in these ideas extremely vulnerable. So basically, Trex has these guys by the short and curlies. <laughs> And really, has anybody who actually participated in owning these as through a sort of cap capital gains perspective, they're in a very tough position if if Trex decides to play some games. Um, Sen says, hi, guys. Are you answering questions from YouTube? Uh, honestly, you know, Sen, I'm just talking way too much. I'm just, uh, unfortunately, I would imagine a lot of people are saying, Jesus, just Get on with it, Brian. Quit blabbing away. Um, uh, Colleen says, can you change it for another coin and get it off there? Well, that's basically what I did um, was I just basically blew it out. And I, you know, I, I put like a 0 0.03 <laughs> into this thing. And I just blew it out and just said, fuck it. I'm going to take the 0 0.015 loss and just walk away. So I have no idea what they're going to do, but in essence, I'm out of Gambit and I'm back into Bitcoins, right? Does that make sense? The thing is, it's not traded anywhere else. So, you know, where, how are you going to exchange it for anything else? And that's, that's the inherent danger. And guys, like you level oneers, right? Own, oh, Colleen, uh, Alicia, so proud of you for really participating. Love that. Right. Um, this is this is this whole sort of conversation about rational analysis is, you know, do your fundamentals, go through Dav's fundamental screener. If it's only listed on one exchange, maybe that means you ought to just cool your jets and leave that thing alone. So, um, All right. Uh, let's sort of keep moving this train forward. So Sen says there's some questions over on YouTube. I think I can try and answer those. Let's see what we got here. How far back was it, Sam? Sam, are you still here? Sam? Is there a specific question? Hey, Colleen's over there on YouTube. Um, uh, well, it looks like Colleen's given us a positive uh, uh, vote of endorsement, so that's good. The network effect, yeah. Are, are you talking about the log scale there, Sen? Which broker do you use to trade futures? Um, well, actually, I'm not really trading futures right at the moment, uh, just because I got so much on the go. Um, I trade um, uh, primarily if I'm going to uh, trade in the marketplace. I'm using my stock account, and I trade stock options. So on any particular futures market that I'm interested in, I'll go into the stock market, find the uh, equivalent ETF, and um, and uh, and 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 shop options uh, on those because options give you a way bigger bang for your buck. Um, so don't really talk about uh, trading futures contracts specifically. Um, just because I just haven't gotten around to it, I suppose I could fund an account. Um, and ironically enough, you know what, actually what I want to do, if I can ever get finished this silly educational program is uh, I want to go back to top step and get refunded and, and run an account off of top step, uh, just day trading and have them clear all my trades. That's ideal. I've been wanting to do that for a couple of years now, but I've just been hip deep with this crazy educational program. So hopefully that's coming to an end and uh, we can get most of this automated and then I can uh, I can get back to my old. It was the prop firm that uh, I was funded through. I don't know whether I have it in the library here or not. I should. I know I have lots of uh, videos of theirs. Um, but you can, uh, Dr. Andrew Meneker was a, was our sort of our psychologist at Top Step. So that's why I've included, uh, he had really good uh uh, videos, but uh, top step trader. Oops, probably uh, it's these guys. So, um, 
If you are interested in becoming a uh, proprietary trader, a prop trader, I really like uh, these guys. They funded me. Uh, I passed their test. Woohoo! Um, and um, I would highly recommend it. I've sent a, sent a bunch of uh, TRI people to them. But don't get me wrong. This isn't easy. You know, their videos and stuff, Bill, it as uh, you're just sitting there having a cup of coffee. And, oh, yeah, it's so easy. I could trade off my laptop and stuff. <laughs> it's not like that at all. Uh, you know, I mean, it is a it's a tough, tough life being a day trader. Not easy. <laughs> I That's the one thing I don't like about, uh, you know, it's a very American sort of salesman-ish kind of thing. So they're going to, you know, and you can see the video quality, right? They probably put like tens of thousands of dollars into the production of these, you know. Oh, I could trade off my cell phone. Look at me. I'm a man, right? <laughs> All this kind of stuff. And, you know, taught, you know, very uh, slick marketing and stuff. But, you know, it's a big U.S. corporation now. So what do you expect? But uh, anyway, the point of the matter is, is uh, if you were going to go the prop funded uh, trader route, uh, I would recommend you go to Top Step. Uh, a couple of the guys that I talk about in the education program are like integral there. So, good old John Hoagland, the Hoag. Okay, uh, I'm wasting a lot of time here. Um, I know Julian would not like this video at all, but uh, I'm trying to have some fun with you guys today too. Okay, so uh, hopefully we answer. Oh, I never did finish. Let's see if we can find a chart. Remember, I was looking for that chart and uh, never got around to it. Actually, we might. No, we'll see it here. Where do we have that? Oh, yeah, I got sidetracked by that crazy new bit story. Oh, well. But hey, at least I acknowledged it. Brian fucks up just like everybody else. Uh, the question is are you going to let your fuck ups destroy your trading plan? Try not to. Um,. Let's see. Uh, maybe we could do it on the new bids. Why don't we do it on there? So uh, the default sort of chart setup on TradingView is uh, you see there's two numbers here. Um, and to actually see the second number, you have to go in and you have to actually ask for the volume moving average to be reported. And so that's the, what that second number is, right? So if we make that like a line, uh, and a lot of people like to do like area charts for their volume studies. So um, in essence, uh, if we zoom right in, the first number that you see reported, right? That's today's volume right here. And it says 101.702, right in here, right here. 101.702, that is the uh, actual number of coins traded. Um, and then the second number that you see here, right, it says uh, 113.164. That is their moving average of uh, the, the volume. And uh, I think, uh, well, they don't even tell you what the setting is. Uh, maybe it's over here. Uh, moving average. Okay, so you can set the length with, to what you want, right? And a lot of people use moving average, structuring moving averages of the volume to basically confirm that same thing that the level ones just learned with that volume impetus concept. Uh, Julian says, what would you consider an acceptable 24-hour volume? Ooh, that's a tough one. Because the problem is, is different coins, will, uh, and really, are you talking about futures? Are you talking about stocks? Are you talking about uh bitcoin are you talking about uh shult coins um you know it, it, how many coins are out you know if you have a coin that has a bazillion coins out then obviously it can handle more volume on a daily basis if you have a coin that only has like maybe a few million coins out then you're not going to get that much volume so uh that's a pretty big question julian um Really, what I want to study, and hopefully you learn this in the level one program, is what's the trend in volume? Who's driving the bus, right? What's the trend in volume momentum indicators, things like on balance volume? So, you know, you've probably seen on uh, my charts, you know, here's a good example. This is uh, Bitfinex, four hour what I really want to see is what's this thing doing, the on balance volume indicator. And then what I really want to see is what's the relative performance of volume. 
who's who's sort of leading, who's driving the bus. Like, yes, we do have a potential double bottom coming in here, but you can see the activity here is like nothing. So this move, if it does break out, if it doesn't come on volume, you have to look at this very suspiciously. So, you know, this move on this big volume bar, well, you know, they say volume speaks volumes. So that's an important event. And this volume bar that breaks the OBV out, right, volume speaks volumes. Um, if we get a breakout here and it's like on no volume, well, then I have to sort of look at it and go, is that really for real? Maybe that's going to set up like an actual volume divergence, which is very bad. In fact, actually, recently in Bitcoin, we did have a volume divergence there, right? Um, and this is sort of what got me concerned um, <clears throat> coming out of this was uh, sort of midweek when uh, the Fed minutes, we were waiting for the Fed minutes. What were they doing? The bot still had a long signal working and following the Fed minutes, nobody pooped their pants. The market jumped up on the New York close, but you notice that the volume really wasn't that impressive. And what's worrisome here is we get a volume divergence, right? Where you have that high to that high, that's a higher high in price, right? But you look at the OBV and you see that the OBV indicator actually made a lower high right here to here. So that was a major warning sign. Something is not right here. So, you know, so and is it a function of the actual number of coins? Well, I look at the volume impetus, which is a tough concept to learn. But in essence, we want to see, you know, higher highs and higher lows defines a bull market. Lower highs and lower lows defines a bear market. So we can actually look at the volume bars and we can say, okay, are we making higher highs? Or are we making lower highs? And you can clearly see massive volume here, then quite a bit less, and then, oh boy, quite a bit less, quite a bit less. And then on that breakout event up here, there was that bullish volume bar, didn't come anywhere near these highs, let alone this high. And that's what sort of painted that divergence. And then, you know, exact opposite, bears came alive here. You can see them active here. Then they quieted down, and then on that failed breakout, the bears really came alive right here and confirmed that divergence in volume. So um, it's not necessarily a very specific number. Now, if I was talking like futures contracts, things like that, that are fairly standardized, then we can start coming up with, you know, sort of raw numbers we want to hunt for. But on balance, um, it's that's a relative question. So, um, wow, that's a, a good question, but hopefully I helped answer that. Uh, <clears throat> um, Lord Helmken, it, it's not really like I allow or disallow. It's just that I can't look at every damn screen. I got like three different screens going here. And um, and keep in mind that I'm supposed to be giving priority uh, to the uh, to the school people, and they had a whole bunch of questions, right? So really, what I wanted to do was try and work my way through the uh, school questions. Uh, let's see, where are we here? Speaking of school questions, which page was that? That was over here. So hopefully, I answered that. Um, Whoever asked that question, who asked that question? Uh, Ilya? Ilya? Um, it only took me about an hour to answer your question. <laughs> but I think I got it answered. Um, okay, so I answered that. Uh, what's this? Can you please explain the number? Yeah, okay, so I answered that. Uh, tried to answer your question on, but a very different market state. And ironically enough, actually, that, that, that event actually marked the breakout in gold, I think. Uh, talked about log versus uh, linear a little bit. Uh, what do you know uh, around the market? Do traders put their stops and take profit orders on the exchange, or do they babysit their charts as to not to play their hand, I guess, in that case? Yeah, okay, so, um, John, I'm going to let Thomas uh, speak to that when he's on uh, Monday. 
Uh, for whatever it's worth, uh, John, when I was futures trading, um, every single trade that I put on the books was uh, what they call AOCO, which stands for um, automatic order cancels order. So I would place my entry order on the DOM. Uh, it would be AOCO. As soon as that order was filled, a sell at a profit target was uh, placed on the DOM and a stop loss order was placed on the DOM. If either of those two orders were filled, then the other order would be instantly be canceled. Um, and every single futures trade I did was AOCO. So just an FYI. Now, with regard to crypto, uh, you know, it's it's an evolving space. Um, and of course, Thomas is uh, he loves to watch his screen 24 seven. Um, so he might have a little different perspective. And of course, remember, Thomas trades on the casino. So you got to understand the casino's got a whole bunch of nuances around that. So I'll let Thomas specifically speak to his uh, trading on the casino to answer that question. Uh, but uh, if this is futures trading, then like I said, I would just do everything AOCO. Uh, okay. I recently said BNE in the lounge on the weekly chart. William saying B W W. I made crosses on the channel. So I bought it, but all the daily momentum indication. W and cross the MA, been in the overbought chair. I'm not sure what to think of that. Well, you know, uh, what I would simply say here, Steve, is uh, did you set your profit objective when you entered the order? Um, did you set your stop loss objective? Was it like little old lady and you're just going to risk the, the investment capital? Or is it a Joe six pack? You got to risk, you know, you got to walk away at 50% loss. Are you a margin trader? where you have to, uh, you know, obviously uh, AOCO, kind of like what I said with futures, are you a derivatives trader where you have to think about what happens if your option or warrant or right goes to zero, right? Because very easily they can just lose all value altogether. So uh, a bunch of moving parts here really all depends on what your sort of risk taker is. Um, I like the idea and I teach on my courses and classes and everything that before you enter the trade, all of your levels and everything should all be predefined. So um, uh, if you went and I don't know whether this is a stock or a crypto, but let's see what we get here. Not a crypto. Oh, oh you bought that damn oil stock, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we've been talking about oil stocks uh, on the uh, on the site. I mean, look at this. What a I mean, this is this is a get bad. Come on. <laughs> I mean, damn. I mean, that's everything that that we do uh, on the site. And of course, I missed the damn trade. <laughs> uh, I think it, 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 what makes me cry, Cully. Cully goes, "Oh, don't cry." Right? But what makes me cry is when I see a really good trade just slip through my fingers. <laughs> so uh, we'd be saying, "All right, well, fifty percent rule. Um, that should be your target." Uh, you can see this big old gap up here. That seems pretty obvious. Look at all these gaps up here. So you can you can definitely see that if I was going to short and sort of all the sort of institutional players, if they were going to short, right, what do you think the odds are that against this original, and, you know, such a good example, what are we supposed to think if we ever see the market smiling at us? I mean, it's just beautiful. I mean, it's so textbook. So uh, fantastic trade. Now, this is one thing, you know, like, um, ah, so that's interesting. Uh, sort of a follow-up to people who asked about uh, uh, log charts on Bitcoin. Uh, somebody on YouTube says uh, log charts of BTC is based on number of users. Hmm, interesting. Um, all right. So, uh, and thank you, thank you for that comment there, Mark. I appreciate that. Um, if I was going to be shorting, you know, nice juicy gaps up top here, reload zones, right? If we probably change this to a reload zone, you probably see that. Mm, where is that? Uh, there we are. Yep. So there's seventy-eight point six. My hunch is probably going to work its way up into that area there. 
Uh, you can see there's a cheeky little gap right in there that could be filled in. So if I was thinking short, like I actually wanted to get short, I would sort of start my hunting process up in here. Location, location, location. Uh, if I was long off the bottom, you never know. You might not get this counter trend rally up top here. It just might not happen. So I always suggest to people use the 50% rule as a tar because this is um, target. Because this is a WD GAN, and WD GAN basically says um, what should happen is uh, there's the top of the move. There's, I don't know whether we go there or there. Why don't we go there? Can't tell exactly where the bottom is, but let's assume that that's the sort of range. Let's see what this low is. 534 or 534 or 531. Oh, okay. All right. So if this is the low, then Mr. Gann would say this market, if it went down in this duration, then it probably should take about half of that to work its way back to the 50% rule. So in essence, the 50% rule is nothing more than, actually, this is overdue. Right? It should be something like that. This market should have traded up to this level by this window here, which makes me, leads me to believe I'm kind of thinking maybe it should be something along those lines. But anyway, just sort of simple illustration for you here. So that's 113 bars. So that would be, what, 55? Something like that. Uh, nope, sorry. Something like that. Right. Um, I wonder if this is the pace. But basically, Mr. Gann postulated that uh, he, the market will bounce 50% of the time, and it was, should take about 50% of the duration of the down move to move back up to this 50% level. It's sort of a very natural thing for markets to do. So my hunch is probably into that sort of, you know, buy your own lead in the middle of February, sell at the middle of May, made money nine out of the past 10 years, right? Kind of talk. In fact, actually, we were even talking about that for uh, the seasonality, right? Um, really, uh, a rally into this area makes sense, right? And then, um, you know, double bottoms. Hopefully, everybody can see the beautiful W. There's lots of opportunity to get in off of that level. Could you have gone in off of the uh, wick level? Sure. I mean, really, just going to be more risk. But even if you went off of that wick level, and we were talking about this in the level one class, do you guys remember this this morning? There's not really a right or wrong. All that really matters is that you identify your risk. Um, and really, because this low is actually higher than this low, I actually kind of think the W actually fires off of that level there. And really, all that matters is we just want to, you know, if we are going to use a 50% level as a target here, we really want to try and make sure that this is a two to one risk reward. So you can see here that's 3.33. So could you have just bought the break of this Wix high here? What is that, 704? Sure. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just if you're going to do that and you're taking any kind of size risk that's greater than, you know, few percent of your portfolio, shall we say, um, you've got to blow it out if it breaks these lows. If it's just a few percent of your portfolio, then eh, no big deal. Um, anyway, the point of the matter here is that's how I would sort of look at the trade. Now, this is a really cool addition, and it just is a great sort of um, – it's an analogy that old dogs can always learn new tricks. You never finish being a student of the market. You can always learn new things. Always, always, always. 30 years into this, always learning new shit. Always. So just because you take the level one, two, and even three course. In fact, I've got like about four or five modules for a level four course ready to go that I just haven't had time to put together. But the point here is... <clears throat> Um, Grim, our level one instructor right now, he's that good. 
he's postulated because I use uh, this uh, this thing called the bot to trade trend continuations, and really all it is is just A B equals C Ds. Let's see if we can give you an example. Uh, just really quickly here. Well, this might not be a bad one. All right, we go A to B, something like that, and then we just uh, bought that up. <clears throat> so we went 33. And eh, let's assume that that's three higher lows just for the purposes of this. We need to uh, apply those levels off of those lows, right, whatever that is, painting an upside target, and we would apply the bot trade rules, right? Enter 25, notice the double bottom that's basically there. 50%, move your stop to scratch, 66, start locking in profits. And in this case, I think maybe you, you walk away locking in profits because we never did hit that 100%. Eh? So the point of the matter here is Grim said, I really love these trade management rules where in essence, if I break this move that I'm looking for into thirds or excuse me, quarters, and I try and force myself to get in off at 25% of that range, then in essence, if I ride it to the target, then it's a three to one risk reward. And of course I have move stop to break even. I stop to trailing, start locking in profits. Uh, built into my trade. And he sort of said, well, what happens if I just take the rules and I apply it to something like a 50% rule and just adjust the levels and notice, gee whiz, the 25 level seems to sit up almost perfectly off that $7.04. $7.22, it would seem here. And we're going to adjust that. Isn't that cool? So I think to sort of answer your question right now, if I was looking at this, and uh, maybe if you're lucky, and I often talk about front running the bot, right, try to get in on a W ahead of this 25% level. If I can do that, then if I have hit, move, stop to scratch, and it comes back to the 25 level, I'll walk. And I even have a little bit of profit built in. So maybe you were like super aggressive and said, you know, this W confirmed here, and I'm going to try and sneak my way in off of this clothesline of this W because that's such a sick ass level. And look, it gave you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 days to get in on that trade. You can't say you didn't have the opportunity to get in on the trade. It's just a question of, did you have the balls to pull the trigger when the W's came in and the appropriate levels and were you a professional? And actually that also speaks to that article that I just did for those big, uh, uh, Bitcoinist, I think it is. Um, where the hell heck was that? It's on the Twitter feed. Um, Ironically enough, they even asked me, they said, well, you know, is is technical analysis like astrology? And so it could be, you know, uh, people kind of laugh at like guys like W.D. Gann who take uh, trades based on planetary relationships. But the irony of it all is I couldn't give a rat's ass. If it works more than 66% of the time, then I'm looking up at the sky and asking if jupiter and saturn have crossed yet before i'm taking a trade <laughs> simple as that i want to do more of what works and less of what doesn't and i don't care if it's the stars and i joke in the education program i say i don't care if it's like you know th you throw your dog's dog food in the bowl if it lands on the left side it's a buy signal if it lands on the right side it's a sell signal if it works more than 66 percent of the time then i don't care but we're asking rover whether we should be buying or selling um so you know their answer and i know a lot of people are like they laugh at astrology but damn i've seen some pretty compelling stuff about astrology so i wouldn't laugh too hard but um you know i said could we incorporate astrological signals at, as a reason to act in our setup sure the only thing that matters and this youtubers this is the value here right and the irony of it all is that it's not sexy. It's not going to get me on CNBC. And yet this is the actual shit of whether you are a pro or not. The only thing that matters is when uh, we uh, trade these reasons and they are con consistent reasons, they produce desired results more often than not. 
I think that, you know, as rational investors, like I said here, we can get to 66%. But even if we're better than 60% of the time at better than a two to one, you're making lots of money. And really, this is the bottom line. How you get those reasons is entirely up to you. Some people like fundamentals. Some people like technicals. Some people like to consult the stars. I don't give a shit. If it works more than 66% of the time, I'm going to be looking at the stars too. But here's the key. Being a professional and acting when you see those reasons, that's the sign of the pro where they just say, look at my training plan says when this, this, and this happens, I do that. Otherwise, I don't do anything at all. And if this, this, and this happens, you have to act. But unfortunately, what ends up happening is that even if you vetted out your setups, the amateur still won't act when those reasons come in because they just don't know. So, you know, that's the difference between a pro and an amateur when it comes to a trading world is have you vetted, you know, if W's are your reason, you know, after calamitous uh, meltdowns, especially on higher time frame, like weekly price charts, I think this was a weekly W, right? You can see the cute little weekly W here. If that's what gets you to act, and if 50% move of the most recent range is greater than a two to one, you want to throw in some indicator confirmation. Um, you know, I don't really care if you want to consult the stars, and that happens to be a reason that lines up some sort of, you know, planetary alignment I told you to get long off of this event. Fine, but the key here is when it does happen, you have to act. So. Back to our story here. At this point, had I taken this W, or even this one, then I would be saying, you know, and like I said, old dog learns new tricks. I love this approach. Because once you hit this move stop to scratch level, the relative anxiety of being in a trade melts away. And remember, that's half our battle in this silly game, is just dealing with our anxieties. Um, yeah, at this point here on this trade, because it's so close to the 25 level, I'd say the trade just started. Uh, and I personally would just be like, well, we just got to give this some room to breathe. It might might get stopped out. Totally possible. Um, if we trade up to this 9, what is that, 908 area, then I get to move my stop to this 25 level. 721 where i can now and if i did front run and i got off this level then i book a small profit if i just taken off of this double bottom well i'd still make a small profit um but you know basically cover costs uh if we get to 1027 then i can start thinking about hunting reasons to lock in my profits uh and with the ultimate objective of this 1281 so i hope that helps answer that question Good question. No doubt about it. Not going to say. And also, too, remember, guys, I mean, just because I said this, that doesn't mean this thing can't come back down and stop you out at a loss. Only possible. Okay. Uh, let's keep moving this train forward. Um, all right. Um, yeah, I mean, this that that stock, that, that oil stock, there was a whole bunch of them. There was... Um, uh i can't even go through the list there's was, there was just a pile of them that all beautiful w's and it was weird it was sort of like the the major oil stocks and the major oil services stocks they all broke out in like uh late december early january uh halliburton we reviewed uh in the daily brief uh, last week because somebody asked about it on the site uh that uh zach stock that u.s silica um, it's, it's already basically, I think it's hit its target, hasn't it? So the bigger stocks, they've already moved. And it felt like this past couple of weeks has been all about the mid cap oil stocks rally. And that's what I've been seeing there. So. Okay. I've been moving all the level one material and came across the different market states require different plan setups, uh, ranging and trending markets require different setups. Could you explain? Um, okay, so the, I guess the question would be, you know, what time frame are you? Are, are, are you a uh, uh, an investor trading off like weekly charts? 
Um, are you a, a position trader trading off of daily charts? Are you a swing trader trading off of like four hour charts? Are you a day trader trading off of like, you know, half hour, hour charts? So that's pretty important. We have to uh, put into context what time frame you're working off of, Steve. Um, and yeah, I mean, the long and short of it here, this is, you know, for this particular market participant we were just doing there a moment ago, this market participant, I would call this a, a position trader's trade. And this is a trading range. So for the position trader, um, this is a ranging market. Um, and the 50% rule, this is like what we'd call our L tangonator setup, especially if we had like a bullish MACD divergences and stuff here uh, that happened to form off of this off the bottom. This would be an absolute textbook L tangonator. Uh, and does that make sense, Colleen and Own and B Bloom and Alicia, when I say that? Does that make sense to you? Are you familiar enough? Like, especially coming out of level one. You should really understand, you know, classic range trade setup is that L Tangonator, right? Where all we're doing is we're just looking for a 50% retracement of this range. But, you know, you might be a swing trader and be like operating off of like the four hour charts. And you might look at this actually a little differently, right? The swing trader might say, holy free holies, you know, this, this market's already rallied, right? And the swing trader maybe was trading this trending model the bot uh if we go bot setup 33 percent, no more than 66 clone that bad boy and looks like we got one low two lows three lows not bad and we go bot trade oh <laughs> isn't it incredible can you guys see this like colleen can you see do you see how this, like, look at this, motherfucking son of a bitch. <laughs> Isn't that, like, you YouTubers, this, there'd be guys on Wall Street that would charge you, like, $5,000 just to see this image and have him explain and walk through this. I mean, it's, oh, God, it kills me when I see stuff like this. So the swing trader is trading this trading um trend right where we have bullish market structure and that we're going to use trending market setups to trade this trending market state but that happens to be off of the swing traders perspective so and you can see ding 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 they're ringing the register up here right nice three to one risk reward and look at that setup damn i mean <laughs> That's just absolutely incredible. This is uh, the these these intermediate oil stocks have just been sick lately. Oh, it's just driving you nuts. <laughs> and I just never have enough time to look, go through all of this stuff. But anyway, there you go. Um, where should we do this? We'll go. Um, uh, well, I'll just I'll go uh, swing trend. Actually, here, why don't we do it not here? Let's do it over on the uh, request page. Uh, uh, do, 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 do. So what was that? That was, uh, yeah, Steve S. Actually, Steve asked a couple good questions here. So we'll go boom. And we'll go, I just blew, oh, yeah. And then we'll go. Uh, and then we'll say within the context of a larger range position trade. So, Steve, when you watch this later on, oh, wait a minute. Is this the right room? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think I did this right. Steve, there he is there. Uh, so, Steve, what's super, super important that you're going to have to put everything into context of what uh, time frame you're operating off of. What type of trader are you? All right, and then we'll zoom out. And then we'll put that. Uh, where was that? Over here? No. Here. No. 
I need Owen to uh, yell at me which tabs are the right tabs. Isn't that weird? Where'd it go? Not there, not there. Was it here? Oh, it was here. Um, so uh, let me know, Steve, if uh, if that answered your question. But uh, it's a good question. Perfectly good question. Uh, not going to be easy. And, you know, the interesting thing is sort of a funny side anecdote. Um, uh, funny uh, side anecdote. <laughs> um I remember one time I was sitting uh, on the floor um, and, you know, we're just all sitting there getting ready for another day of trading, right? And I had one of these sort of eureka moments. <laughs> and I go right into the lounge. I go, oh, this trading shit's so easy. I just figured it out. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, oh, okay. So what's the secret? <laughs> and I said, all you got to do is just figure out whether the market's trending or ranging and just follow the appropriate setups. <laughs> and everybody's like, Duh! <laughs> uh, took you that long to figure that out, Brian? <laughs> so, you know, finding out whether the market is ranging or trending unto itself is no easy task, right? And that's basically a trader's life. But hopefully that what I just showed you there helps you, Steve. Uh, Tony says, requesting a brief explanation on how to draw trend lines, bullish and bearish. Found some info in the library, but I do believe uh, there is how to set up a trade based on. Yeah. Problem here, Tony, is, um, uh, and I know you're starting the level one program in the spring here. You really have to understand the concept of market structure. Uh, and that's like what? Week uh, one, two, uh, three week four of uh you're eating your vegetables where we sort of teach you the basics of uh of technical analysis what do markets in transition look like um understanding the concepts of m's and w's heads and shoulders triangles all that kind of stuff um and once you understand the concept of market structure then you understand uh trend lines um, and it's really important to distinguish. There are many different types of trend lines. So as a result, um, I actually have a full module in the level two program on drawing trend lines because there's a whole bunch of different ways you can do them. For example, um, you know, uh, sort of the very popular out of the box uh, trend lines is just market structure. But we can also do fun things like... Um, Oh, let's see if I can find charts that have them on here. I thought, I thought I had them on here this morning. I know I would delete it a whole bunch earlier. Um, hmm. What did I do with... I think I had it off of... Which one am I thinking about now? Uh, I seem to recall it off of one of these. Nope, not there. Um, yeah. oh, well, here's one. So this happens to be Bitcoin, Japanese yen. Um, and the, this is a little trend channel and it's interesting how price even it respected that channel up here. Um, and really, uh, how you draw channels, um, is a whole, uh, conversation in our level two program. So, um, you know, there's there's channels. Actually, I might even go off of this one. I like that one. That's a nice channel. Which sort of explains, you know, the rally up here and then the failure and then the rally and then came back to the channel and then lost the channel. Uh, and then also, and I thought I had it on here, we can also do uh, things like uh, high to low trend lines, pivot high to pivot low. That uh, becomes an important level going forward. So not, and you know, the very simplest concept of tr quote unquote trend line is uh, kind of like what this channel looks like is just connecting higher lows um, and having the market actually confirm the breakout to validate the trend line. But, it, you know, I, yes, I mean, that's sort of your easiest way to draw a quote unquote trend line. But actually the conversation is quite a bit thicker than that. There, uh, you know, there's nuances around how you actually go from a, um, a, a potential trend line to a validated trend line. 
um, and then um, how we draw Chen channels, um, and then this concept of high to low uh, trend lines and low to high trend lines. Um, and actually, it's weird. I had like a longer term Bitcoin chart on here, and we had some really cool. Um, it's got to be around here somewhere. Uh, how did I put it? Mm. Darn. Too many charts. Oh, this might be it. So we can actually do a high to low trend line there, and then a high to low trend line there, off of there. Those are actually valid, which creates a massive megaphone. But we had a really cool, uh, yeah, here it is. Oh, good, I found it. Phew. Um, so this, and I think this is actually the dominant trend line right at the moment, although people don't really see it. Um, remember we had talked at the beginning of uh, today's broadcast, uh, Own, uh, about uh, that uh, SEC uh, rejection of the Bitcoin ETF. Remember that? And then if we go off of there. Right. So you can see how that high pivots off of that low and that low. So that actually becomes pretty important market information. And gee whiz, there's that trend line. Look at that shit, eh? That is that trend line like years later. So, and like I put this tweet out, right? The moment we've been all waiting for, because this was a validated market structure trend line failure, right? There there boom boom and then this high to low trend line created this apex event right here um yeah, it's interesting how that's actually i might have had that off a weekly chart which changes them a bit but nonetheless very important uh pivot you know the market state itself changed and then when it re-accepted above that a high to low trend line oh boy all hell broke loose pow so um so i you know i don't mean to be rude tony but uh ironically enough your question even though it seems relatively simple is actually quite complex because there are a number of different ways you can draw trend lines um and um yes in the library we have uh leanne james set up um who is formerly a um a uh, we used to call it a uh, rj setup uh, but some of the female site members didn't really like the way that sounded, so uh, we got rid of the RJ. Uh, but in essence, it's just basically trading, trading trend line breakouts. So that's the setup that you see in the library. But this, ironically enough, actually is a it's a bit more complicated uh, uh, question to answer than what I really want to go into today. It's a full module in the education page. I think it's like a half a module because we do horizontal support and resistance at the same time. Okay, uh, okay, Mr. Bear, yep, okay, looks good. All right, so any further questions? I don't think so. Uh, what's this? For a bot setup, can you find the 33% retracement on one day chart and then find the three higher lows off the four hour chart? It's okay, but I would say you should start at the same time frame and everything operate off the same time frame. So why can't you find that 33% off of that same four hour chart? That would be my question to you, Andre. Um, my hunch is if you can find that 33% off of a daily uh, range, um, then you should be hunting for those three higher lows off of that daily range. Um, and, the, and like I just showed you with this example, where if it's a good trade... Um, the bot levels will set up naturally. It'll almost be like you look at the chart and you go, holy crap, this trade was totally telegraphed. So don't fight it, right? If anything, don't, you know, we have an old expression in the market, don't try and push a chain because it's impossible. You can't push a chain. So uh, if anything, what I would say is, uh, you know, let's see the chart. And like Grim said to you guys in class, the best thing that you can do at TRI is just pop into the lounge and just ask your peers. Because remember, they, they've all been in exactly the same position you're in. They all asked exactly the same questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question. 
right? And and these people are really nice. They're they're nice people. So you're not going to get your head bitten off if you ask a question that you might think is really silly. The, the worst response that I've seen is, um, I think that was talked about a little bit in this, or maybe ask this person or, you know, something along those lines. So, uh, Okay, Andre, did that help you at all? Sure hope so. Uh, holy Jesus, it's already getting on 1 o'clock. I got to get out of here, guys. Okay, um, we got through these questions. Um, I know somebody asked, uh, Sen, I don't know, are you planning on doing a scholarship this term? I, I don't know. That's in, Mike C asked uh, if Sen was going to do his scholarship. That's entirely up to Sen. Uh, I have no input into that. Uh, if he's feeling generous, rock on. If he isn't, um, don't hold it in against him. <laughs> oh, he says he will. So there you go. Merry Christmas. Uh, also, too, before I leave, um, uh, the the uh, interview that I did uh, with uh, these guys, uh, Bitcoinist, right? Uh, we're actually planning on doing a raffle. So anybody who is interested um, in the um, in the education program, and maybe this price is a little steep for you, and you're like, you know, I'd really, really, really like to do this. They, we are having a raffle coming up. So maybe go on over, and I think it applies to the people who actually did a review. Um, and actually, that's kind of cool. Nobody's actually given us a negative review, so that's good. Um, but um, you know, maybe uh, they'll they'll uh, they'll take the raffle out of the people that actually voted. I don't know, but eh, if you like what, the article and it helps you uh, give us a positive review, uh, you know, the more thumbs up uh, always helps. So, <coughs> uh, watch the Twitter feed uh, through the coming week uh, for information uh, about uh, that. Or, you know, pop on over to this uh, Bitcoinist. Uh, in fact, uh, if I didn't post it before, I'll post it again. Um, and if anything, you know, uh, I got to say, hit the likes button, hit the subscribe button. If you like uh, what we've got here, somebody's already downvoted us. So uh, I can see that uh, we've got our resident uh, people that are like, Brian, this guy well, talks way too much. Um, so... Um, I think we'll probably have to leave it at that. I got to get ready for Liam. So have yourselves a great day, everybody. Um, I'll leave it at that. And like I said, probably the most important thing that we needed to talk about about the Twitter feed was uh, this week was uh, me blowing out the new bits position. Keep in mind, and thank you very much for everybody's positive uh, reinforcement about this. I, you know, we all take punches in the nose. It's the way it goes. Uh, this happened to be a stable coin, so that's why we had as much BTC into it as as we did. Uh, and, yep, I took the punch in the nose. I'm a professional. Just got to ride with the punches. Um, next bus in 10 minutes. Um, all right. I think I'll leave it at that for today. Uh, you guys have yourselves an awesome rest of your day. Great interaction on the site. Great to see people posting questions. If I uh, missed a question that you really wanted answered, uh, post it again. In the um, in the uh, request here, I know I see you say I got a question tucked in there above. Uh, this could you talk about kill zones and crypto? I did talk a little bit about uh, I talked about the news events. I eh? saw the news. Uh, let's maybe do that uh, tomorrow morning uh, on the daily brief. Okay, Alicia. Um, in fact, my hunch is uh, through uh, New York kill zone tomorrow morning. We'll see lots of that. So we should be able to give you some good examples. Okay, have yourselves a great day, everybody. I hope you YouTubers enjoyed the offering. Um, now all the best, and um, only thing left for good old Brian to say is a big hearty bye for now.